Good morning everyone, it is a Thursday morning and I know we've got our Zoom uh, today which is fantastic. So looking forward to seeing everybody again, so just make sure you get onto the, uh, onto the Zoom for 11 o'clock. Um, so it does open up at 11 o'clock and you'll be in the waiting room and then we'll be officially open, up, open it up at 10 past 11. Okay, so just want to go over yesterday's shared reading. So uh, we were doing inferences, weren't we? Which can be a bit tricky. And if you remember question one, it talked about that Emily and Grace scrambled to their feet. So scrambled mean they kind of did it quite hurriedly, didn't it? So quite quickly. Um, and then number two, how do we know the stick man wasn't very sympathetic? Uh, well, he wasn't very sympathetic because he didn't actually, he didn't really believe that she was ill and that he just wanted the money. So he wasn't really bothered, was he, what she was like as long as he got the money. And very sort of ruthless, wasn't he? And then uh, question three, the stick man had wheezy breath. So wheezy, but... <gasps> <gasps> So that suggests that well, he just climbed the stairs, hadn't he? Been walking outside, climbed the stairs. So that suggests that he was quite old or maybe he was very unfit or perhaps had health problems because his breathing was quite uneven. And then number four, um, he was very interested in the crumbs of pastry on the floor uh, because as there was crumbs from a pie, this suggests that they were eating pie. And if they ate pie, that means they paid for it with money. And if they paid for the pie with money, that means they had money. And that money should have gone into his purse. He didn't care that they were going to starve. All he wants is his money. And very ruthless, I thought, get out, I've got another family coming in. Um, but as again, it was using evidence from the text, which I haven't shown you on here when I've just gone over it. But again, looked at some work, well, we all have, and some of you uh, were brilliant with your answers using quotation marks for the evidence from the text, which is so important. Okay, so uh, chapter three today, and I'm going to do it in two parts, okay, because it's quite long. So this is called Rosie and Judd. Mrs Jarvis used up a lot of her remaining strength that morning. She led the children away from the slums where they had lived for the past year and down street after street until they came to a much quieter part of town where the houses were big and stately. We had that word, didn't we? Stately. She leaned against some railings to rest. Emily sat down next to her, anxious for her mother. Why is Emily anxious for her mother? Uh, now you've got to be good, Mrs Jarvis said to them. I I'm taking you to a house where I used to work. Only you must be good. Promise me now. Ma, of course we'll be good, Emily said. Mrs Jarvis nodded. Yes, you're always good, she said. That's one thing I did right anyway. What do you mean that's one thing I did right? What does she mean by that? So she's feeling a bit guilty about something. But one thing she did right was raising her kids to be polite, it sounds like. In the window behind them, a finch sang in a tiny cage. It only had room to hop from the floor of its cage to a little perch. And down again, hop, 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 up and down. That's all it could do, isn't it? It couldn't fly. Well, listen to that bird, said Jim. They only sing when they're on their own, Emily told him. He's singing for a friend. Often that's what birds do. Poor little thing, said Lizzie, trapped in a cage. we better go on, said their mother. I'm going to take you to see the only friend I've got in the world. Rosie, she's called. You've heard me talk about Rosie at the big house. The children nodded. It was a long time since their mother had worked in his lordship's kitchen, but she still had stories to tell them about it. And if Rosie can't help us, she sighed, nobody can. Emily helped her up again, and they moved slowly on, pausing at the carriages 
as they swept past them. When they reached the big house at last, Mrs Jarvis was exhausted and sat down on the steps to rest again. She's resting a lot, isn't she? Doesn't sound great. The children gazed up at the tall building. Is this where we're going to live? asked Lizzie. It's too grand for us. So grand is like quite rich and superb. Even though she was only 10, she knew that families like theirs didn't end up in houses like these. Jim's eyes were fixed on something he could see on the top steps, just by the front door. It was an iron boot scraper, which we've learnt about. And it was in the shape of a dog's head. The huge snapping mouth of the dog was wide open, so people could scrape their muds off their boots in its teeth. I've never put my foot in there, he said. Not even with Lizzie's boots on. I wouldn't. It would come snarling down at me and bite my toes right off. When their mother was rested, she picked up her bundle again and led the children down some steps to the basement of the house. She sank against the door, all strength gone. Oh, be good, she murmured to them. She lifted the knocker, the door knocker. They heard rapid footsteps coming. Mrs Jarvis quickly bent down and kissed both the girls on the top of their heads. Oh, God bless you both, she said. Emily looked up at her, suddenly afraid, thinking, why is she saying that? She was about to ask her mother what was happening when the door was opened by a large flowery woman in a white pinafore. She had the sleeve of, sleeves of her dress rolled up so her arms bulged out of them. Her hands and wrists were covered in dough. And as she flung her arms in greeting Jim, he could see her elbows were red and powdery. So what does that suggest? Um, dough, making dough. Her elbows were red and powdery. So she's making bread. And she's obviously using her elbows a lot on the worktops, isn't she? Um, but he's football that he likes to play with. Annie Jarvis, the woman gasped. I never thought I'd see you again, she hugged, covering her with bits of dough. You ain't coming looking for work, have you, after all this time? Just going spare, she is, looking for a new cook. She's got me at it. My dough's like a boulder, Rock. You could build cathedrals out of it. And they would, wouldn't ever fall down. She'll soon put me back on serving upstairs. While she was talking, she hauled Mrs Jarvis and the children into the kitchen and set stools for them around the stove, balancing herself on a high chair and scooping up more flour. She pushed aside the big mixing bowl and sat with her elbows on the table, beaming across at them. And then her smile changed. She reached over to Mrs Jarvis and put her hand on her forehead. Hot! Her voice was soft with concern. You're so hot, Annie, and as white as snow. She looked at the children and the bundles of clothes and belongings that they were still clutching. You've been turned out, haven't you? Mrs Jarvis nodded. You got anywhere? No. And you're not fit for work. You know that. There's no work left in you, Annie Jarvis. A bell jangled over the door, so that's often they'd have a, a bell uh, for the servants. So when the master of the house, not the masters, it was kind of the lords of the house, uh, wanted something, they'd ring a bell, which is probably attached with some string and it'd go through rooms. Um, a bell jangled over the door and Rosie jumped up and ran to the stove. Lord, that's for the coffees. I ain't done them. Anyone comes down and you duck under the table quick, mind. She said to the children, the bell rang again. Sounds like the Lordship is very impatient. All right, all right, she shouted. His Lordship can, can wait five minutes, can't he? While I talk to my friend here. She glanced at Mrs Jarvis again, her face puckered in frowns. My sister's as good as. No, he can wait. His Lordship waits for nothing. So it should be, he can't wait. 
As she was talking, she was ladling the coffee and milk into jugs. And it would have been hot milk. And setting them on a tray, she rubbed her flowery hands on her pinafore, took it off and changed into a clean one. The, her lordship wouldn't want her to see the bits of food or flour. That would not look very good at all. At all. The lord, her lordship would not like that. Um, and a quick afterthought, she poured some of the coffee into a cup and edged it across the table towards Mrs Jarvis. Why is she giving Mrs Jarvis some coffee? She's not feeling well. Maybe it will kind of just waken her up a bit, make her feel a bit better. Go on, she urged. Take it all for the good bread you've baked for him. She ran to the door with her tray rattling in her hand and paused to pull. What does that mean then? Take it all. Take it for all the good bread you've baked him. What's that saying about Mrs Jarvis? So that's saying that Mrs Jarvis used to work there and that she used to bake bread for his lordship. Okay, so she ran to the door with a tray rattling in her hand and paused to pull. A face at the bell as it jangled again. There's only one home left for you now, Annie. It's the house, ain't it? Heaven help you. The workhouse. <gasps> To really emphasise the workhouse at the end to sort of make it sound like quite negative. But what's going to be wrong with the workhouse? Well, do you think that Rosie and Judd will be able to help the Jarvis family? It sounds very helpful. It sounds like she wants to help them. But she did say at the end, there's only one home left for you now, and that is the workhouse. That sounds quite ominous, like something bad is going to happen. Okay, um, so this is video two for today, and video three, we'll be going over the worksheet. Okay, thank you.